Thank you for having me. I want to talk about social media as the channel equipped best to lead what I need to see, which is a braver marketing revolution. Now, there's two things that we really need to get at here uh, across all my slides. One is you guys are in a position to generate a whole new level of um, understanding and inf uh, uh, of what marketing's potential is. Um, and I'm going to talk about why. But the second thing and the key thing really to remember is what this might not apply to all of you. If it doesn't, fantastic. But I've been in organizations, both as a consultant and an insider, where social media is often the last thought. And your creativity is hemmed in by a content calendar that's been planned in advance to the minutiae with not particularly very interesting content at times. It's more about filling a calendar, filling dates, making sure you've got a blog for the Tuesday, uh, a webinar for the Wednesday, and a thought leadership paper for the Thursday. And as long as that content calendar is shared and approved, nobody needs to care about social media. And, you know, I've also been in organizations quite differently where a social media post has been right on point and ready and fiercely, um, you know, on like top of the agenda, really newsy, really engaging, but it's run out of time to be in date because it's gone up the food chain for approval by 17 people and back down the food chain. And a week later, nobody cares. This is the wrong way to look at social media, and I don't get why companies do it, but they're doing it. And we are in a position to do both um, braver marketing with more commercial impact, which is what we have to be all about if we're going to sell it in. But we're also, a, th th this, this, this conversation I want to have you, with you this morning is about potentially changing the structure of our organizations and changing the role and the positioning of social media in the marketing supply chain if you like so who am i i'm i'm running a business at the moment that is there to achieve this mission i'm trying to calculate the commercial value of bravery as a strategy um i got a consultancy called shwaki creative we build winning b2b brands and only for those who are brave enough to go through the journey that they need to um it all came from this this is the book that i wrote um uh it was published in 2021 um, and it's, you know, I wrote it in an effort to eradicate the frustration I was feeling and seeing where marketing, uh, certainly in B2B, but also at times in B2C, is almost left as the last piece. You know, let's give them their 100,000 budget for the year or million budget and make sure we keep eyes on how they spend. But ultimately, all our eyes are on the stuff before marketing. So, um product, sales, and client, you know, the commercial parts that, that they see. My problem is this. The problem I'm trying to solve is essentially that the braver a B2B marketer you are, the harder it is to retain a job. And I get why. I understand why. But we don't help ourselves. As B2B marketers, certainly, and by the way, I'm going to come on to B2C, but in B2B in particular, I feel like we don't help ourselves. So, this was a, uh, a piece of research done by an agency called Frameworks last year. We don't do ourselves any favors. 500 um, senior marketing leaders at uh, a, a companies with a large, um, a large workforce, okay, senior marketing leadership, 73% of them answered a question saying it's going to be harder than ever to get seen by their target audience. So things were going to get harder. They saw everything going on around them and felt, yeah, it's going to be harder to get seen this year. Of that same sample, 90% of them said they were going to do the same thing as they did the year before. They were going to stick to safe and traditional rather than try something new. So that's almost three quarters saying it's getting harder. We need to do something. And 90% of them saying, but we're not going to do anything which leads to the final stat, which is 100%. Oh, my God, that drives me up the wall. It really does. Here's why they feel like this. They think that the uncertainty we're feeling, certainly in the last seven or eight years in business, where you haven't been able to predict anything, certainly since um, the uh, in this country, in the UK, if you're in the UK, you know what Brexit uh, ha has had as an effect on everything we do from supply chains to partnerships to rules and, and regulations. You know that the COVID uh, pandemic had a massive effect on not just how we work and the way we work, but what we're capable of doing. There was GDPR. There's been war in Russia. That It feels like it, for the last eight years, if you switch on the news, it's almost exhausting, right? If you switch on the news at 10 o'clock at night, 
you're going to see something for the umpteenth time that month that you've never seen before. You know, you, your jaw drops and you go, well, nobody could have predicted that. You know, if, if, you, if you're into politics, the number of governments we've had, if you're into sort of social and cultural issues, you know, the, the, the kind of the ways protesting and strikes, you're seeing things all the time that um, equal uncertainty. We're talking about uncertainty a lot. And we're almost waiting to spend our money until certainty comes back. It's like, well, hang on, it'll correct back. But maybe this isn't a, um, a you know, a, a correction waiting to be recorrected. Maybe this is just the way things are. Voltaire said, uncertainty is an uncomfortable position. Certainty is an absurd one. Like, we had it good for a little while before 2016. Between 2012 and 2016, this, <laughs> those four years were golden years for the UK. Like, we really, really were doing things. We had a growing economy. We mon Money was cheap to borrow. We were trying stuff. There was a lot of innovation around. Since then, it's been a difficult place in which to do business. And my contention is we can't wait until it gets easier again. So just to clarify what I mean by bravery. So if you, um, you might recognize this chap. He's all over uh, YouTube. He does MadFest. He does um, talks on behavioral economics and and. and behavioral psychology. His name's Rory Sutherland. He works for Ogilvy. He's very B2B, but he's also a lot B2C. Um, and his, his his thing is, all big data comes from the same place, which is the past. So if you are data-led and data-driven, as we all like to claim to be, what you're essentially doing is saying anything that happened before, we will measure and replicate because we assume that the same thing is going to happen again. But as I just said to you, every night we watch the news and we're like, well, that's never happened before. Or that's new. That's unbelievable. And we talk about it around the water coolers or with our partners or with our friends because it's just jaw-droppingly like, God, who saw that coming? And so what Rory says is data is very good at measuring the past. It's not very good at measuring the future. It really isn't. So if you are basing all of your future plans on what's happened before, what's gone before, expecting it to happen again, you're limiting and narrowing your focus of what you can achieve, because essentially you're living in yesterday, not for today or tomorrow. So here's my thing. You need a superpower. You need to be able to listen to the data. And probably seven out of 10 times conservatively, you need to follow the data, even if just to hold a certain amount of credibility within your organization. All of this stuff is about selling into the organization that we are credible enough and we're savvy enough, and we know what the hell we're doing. So you're going to have to listen to us when it comes to social media, whether it's content, whether it's bravery, whether it's humor, whether it's engagement, whether it's something new. You're going to have to listen to us because we know what we're doing. So you need to be credible. The superpower, you need to listen to the data and then sometimes ignore it, is bravery. And the more often you adopt bravery, the more you understand that fortune genuinely favors the brave. It's a glib saying, potentially, but honestly, it works. Every single time you flex the muscle that is bravery, you give permission for others to be brave around you. Not only do you grow in agency and respect and credibility and people start seeing you as kind of the leader of the gang, like this person knows something. And even if they don't, they're willing to take a risk. And every single time he or she speaks, they're exciting me and they're making sense. Let's give them a certain amount of room or a certain amount of budget. Even if you get it wrong, they'll come back to you because they know you've got an alternative take. And an alternative take on things is far more valuable to CEOs than having 10 people sitting in a room agreeing. Every single time you adopt bravery, you flex that muscle that gets stronger and stronger and stronger. By the way, bravery spreads. Every time you are brave, you give permission to others to be brave. They watch you and go, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Same as, uh, the same is, is often true, and unfortunately, of the opposite, which is craven, fearful, retrenching behavior also spreads. Once you see leaders sort of retrench and get fearful and sort of pack in and sit tight for the, the long haul in a, in, a, in a bunker, so to speak, everybody else does the same. So you are the person that has the ability to unlock a little bit of bravery. By the way, the note at the bottom, it's not necessarily the bravery you are, it's the more often you are able to be a little bit incrementally brave. It doesn't have to be um, death-defying stunts. It doesn't have to be super wacky brave that's going to make you feel self-conscious. It's the more often you take the brave stance. Now, we talked a little bit. I heard some of um, Katie's excellent talk, and she was talking about product uh, and services and, you know, the sort of... I think if you're not in marketing 
uh, certainly in tech, but all elsewhere in B2B and probably in some B2C as well, sort of um, for certain, you know, you think about pharma, you think about banking. There's an element to those in engineering and operations and finance that go, look, marketing's almost cheating. We don't need to spend on marketing. We've got the product. Our product is superlative. Our product is clearly better than all the rest. So why won't we win? Why, why wouldn't we? Marketing's just, uh, you know, icing on the cut. Let, let them have their budget. But we've got the product, and that's going to make us win. It's almost unfair, really, because when you do win, they all go, well, that's the product for you. And when you don't win, they go, well, marketing really screwed up. Um, you know, I'm here to prove that product isn't everything. On its own, it's not enough. This guy here is David Bowie before he was David Bowie. This is David Jones back in the early 60s. Now, in the early 60s, David Jones, before he discovered his inner Bowie, was just another skinny white male pop star. And there were loads of skinny white male pop stars about. By the way, this is before my time. I'm not young, but I'm not that old. Um, there was lots of skinny white male pop stars doing the same stuff. They were standing um, in front of microphones and trying to get on top of the pops and trying to release their new records. And David Bowie, yet to be, still had the soul, the heart, the energy, the innovation, the craziness, the creativity of David Bowie. Even when he was David Jones, it was the still product, still the same product. He was still him, right? He was still the person that came up with all of that greatness, but he was calling himself David Jones and trying to look like everybody else. And the BBC decided that the person that became David Bowie was devoid of personality. Um, it wasn't until to his product, he added a strong sense of brand, distinction, creativity, and became the Bowie that is still and will always be celebrated. Product isn't enough. So that, I, I want to give you three quick tips before we move on to, um, or three things that I see that social media warriors like you have in your uh, basket, in your potential to go and create commercial impact and success and a braver marketing revolution. Firstly, you have the ability to make people feel. This is how not to sell. This, I kid you not, is a slide that I found in the pitch deck of one of my clients before they went into a big meeting and I had to argue it out of their pitch deck. This is, here's everything we've ever thought and everything we've ever said and everything you need to know about our product. This is how not to sell. This is how to sell. And this is what you guys have the ability to do. With one line of copy, with one word of copy and an emotive picture and some tension and some conflict and some 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 anticipation and some knuckle dragging fear about what's about to happen you can create eyeballs you can create engagement you can you can raise and elevate the um the awareness of your brand so make them feel secondly break some rules if you look think have a think for a moment about everyone you've ever celebrated in life everyone we celebrate as a country as a nation as a people, whoever and whatever your tribe is, who are the people from history that you celebrate? And have a think about what binds them, what, what, what they have in common. And it's very, very probable that a huge percentage of the people you or we celebrate as heroes broke rules. There's a guy called... Um, there's a guy called... Uh, what's his name? Charlie Sheen. God, nearly forgot. One of my favourite actors couldn't remember his name uh used to play um jed bartlett in the west wing and i saw him once on a youtube video uh talking to the guy's an activist he's a proper proper he gets involved in so many causes and i saw him on a youtube video for about 10 minutes talking to a stadium of children about the power of activism and he had this rule he had this this thing that he said every truth started as a blasphemy it's lovely, that, isn't it? Every truth we understand to be true started as something that nobody believed, that couldn't possibly be true, that you had to prove. Uh, or, or in Star Wars language, you can't have a revelation, uh, a revelation, you can't have a revolution without a rebel. A rebel somewhere has to start the fire for other people to start breaking the rules in terms of doing good. If you think about the biggest and most important uh, issues of our time, think about the pay gap between men and women and the and the and the gap between what women earn compared to what men earn for doing the same job so there's this really lovely campaign that goes out um every year for one day 
on International Women's Day, companies are absolutely brilliant for the 24 hours at celebrating women, picturing their women and photographing their women and shouting out to their brilliant women colleagues and calling out to their mums and daughters and sisters and aunties. And, and it's brilliant for one day. And then the next day, they all go back and they basically uh, buy in unwittingly, e e even if so, to this pay gap where women get paid less for doing the same job. And that's never going to change unless somebody somewhere breaks the rules. And I saw this campaign uh, at 3.24, we're out the door. That's the time of the day at which point we women get stop getting paid as much as you guys. So that's when we're going to finish. And I loved it. And I just thought that's powerful. But I don't see it happen. When I'm in an office with men and women colleagues, I don't see women walking out the door and men doing the same to support them. Because it's against the rules, because you're meant to be there till half five or six o'clock. Nothing's going to change those business, those boards, um, this terrible, terrible inequality, right? Until somebody breaks the rules and companies go, wait, 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 where are you going? It's only 25 past, you're leaving. This is what's going to happen. People have to break the rules to do good. So I'm asking you to consider, as social media marketers, you can't break the rules with product marketing. You can't break the rules with... Um, you know, a, a kind of B2B sales one pager. You guys can break the rules and push it a little bit and be braver. Sometimes you have to turn your argument into maths to get anybody to listen to you. For a long time, I tried to get, in my career, brand awareness into the, uh, into the appetite and the KPIs and the actions of companies I've worked for. And they listened to my arguments and, you know, they'd hear me say for ages, this is how you're going to sell more both now and in the future. If people actually know and love and recommend your brand and they'd go, yeah, we get it, Mark. We get it. It's really, really interesting. Thanks very much. And it would never be adopted as a KPI. And the first time I ever, ever got it adopted as a business wide KPI was when I stopped talking and just turned it into a, a mathematical formula. I can't remember how I did it. I just said, listen, there's this thing in marketing that everybody, no matter who you are in marketing, we agree with. And it's basically this. You spend more of your share on your share of voice than you do have in share of market. So your share of voice, the media, the, your sound, like, you know, getting your message out there is bigger than your share of market. Your business is going to grow. If your share of voice is underneath your share of market or less than, your business is going to shrink. And that's just an eternal truth shown in many, many case studies. Share of voice over share of market, you'll grow. Share of voice under share of market, you'll shrink. And they went, ah, oh, I get it. Why didn't you say so earlier? And they got it because it's a it's a, a data. It's a, it's a mathematical formula. So then started trying to figure out what else I could turn into mathematical formulas so finance people and everybody else could get it. And, you know, there's this lovely thing in my book by a very, very smart guy called Doug Kessler of Velocity Partners. You should definitely check him out. He's firstly, he's got an amazing head of hair. So bald people like me, just he's a he's a hero already. Secondly, he's got this lovely New York American drawl. Could listen to him all day. But mostly he's just one of the smartest guys I've ever met in B2B. And he's got this thing that I, I wrote up in my book when I interviewed him, which is um, if you want to have impact through what he calls the only multi-million dollar weapon that b2b marketers wield which is tone of voice you need to have two things if you accept that in maths anything times zero is zero you need to have two things there you need to have voice so tone of voice you need to have an edgy or humorous or engaging a human tone of voice plus a story to tell you need to have something to say if you've got a really edgy tone of voice and you're swearing everywhere and it's really cool but actually you've got nothing to talk about that's that's voice times nothing is nothing if you've got a really dull jargonistic business corporate tone of voice and nobody can bear to listen to you but you've got something brilliant to say but nobody's reading your stuff again it adds up to nothing impact is voice times story so i've learned right now to try and figure out how to turn the point i'm making into into math or i call it creating the data so if your cfo needs to see data on what you plan to do your big idea or your big campaign or your social media bravery, find a way to create the data. If the data isn't there, find a way to create it. Here are three companies or three um, social media campaigns that I loved. I was involved with one of them um, that uh, where we created our own data. So three real world acts of brand bravery. 
Um, Luan, do stop me if there are any questions, but I'm racing through because I'm going to make sure that I finish on time today, which I'm not saying it would be a first, but, you know, it would be a first. So um, the first one was um, Frankenstein's uh, Monsters in Salt Lake City. This is the one I was involved with. I was working for Qubit, software, um, uh, software customer experience platform. So a, a huge suite of customer experience um, uh, tools and apps, all integrated, built from the ground up around the customer. It was a very small company at the time. And we were going up, most of all, against Adobe and their you know, huge customer experience suite, which was based on a load of... Um, acquisitions from the market of different technologies that were never built to talk to each other. They just clunk them together and we'll charge them more. We have this, 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 and this, like pound them together and it'll make it work. Ours was this kind of really smooth platform of stuff that was integrated and built to work and speak to one another. So we used to, and quite naughtily, but quite truthfully, call them Franken clouds. Um, and they didn't know we existed. We were so small. We were not on their radar. And I got a call one day. I was the communications director there uh, running marketing in Europe. And um, I got a call from my CEO's office to say, Mark, can you come up and see the boss, please? He wants to see you right away. Yeah, okay, cool. And I was climbing the stairs to his office going, oh, bollocks, what have I done? What have I done in the last two weeks that might have got me in trouble that I've got found out for? I couldn't think of anything. So I walked into the office and there was the CEO, the other three founders and one other senior guy. And the CEO looked at me and said, Mark, please come in, sit down. What we're about to tell you, we need you to keep secret from absolutely everybody in the company. We're going to need to send you to America for a couple of weeks on a secret mission. And I was like, well, if you ever want to get my buy-in for a project, this is how you do it. Um, I felt a bit like James Bond. So they said, "Have you, you've just got a new kid. Um, um are you going to be okay traveling from it? I said, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. He said, you're going to need to go to New York to build a team. And you're going to uh, then go to Salt Lake City in Utah, where a place I've never been before or in, in indeed since. The plan was this. Adobe was going to host its annual um, Adobe Summit for 5,000 digital marketers, our, our audience, uh, in Salt Lake City two weeks hence. We had two weeks to get this stuff together. We were going to go and invade um, the uh, the summit with 25 large American guys dressed as Frankenstein. And we were going to have a T-shirt on all of them saying Dump Frank. And we were going to, or dumpfrank.com. And we were going to try and somehow engage and entertain delegates from the moment they got off the bus to the moment they passed through the doors into like Adobe Kool-Aid world where, you know, they'd paid handsomely to be. So they were definite buyers in of Adobe. We needed to somehow engage them in that short space. Now, I'm not a big fan of guerrilla marketing. I love the uh, bravery. I love the um, the spirit. And I love it when it works. But guerrilla marketing can go horribly wrong. And if it goes wrong, you have sometimes legal trouble, sometimes reputational trouble on your hands. So it has to be done right. We were going to um, figure out how to stay in salt lake city and find these actors but there was nowhere to stay in salt lake city because all the hotel rooms had been booked up by adobe delegates so we found an airbnb and we bought the airbnb got the airbnb booked we got a van for transport we got food in we got we've got a booking of a, a like a an american waitrose equivalent and you know filled it with food and then we needed our actors so we put an ad in the local paper saying if you are an out of work actor that's huge in stature, please come to this address at four in the morning. We can't tell you why, but it, there's two days work in it for you. And if you don't like it when you get here, we'll give you breakfast and you can go off. And we thought it might work. And we got there and 25 guys showed up. We had booked uh, a movie style film crew to do them up in three hours. And um, there is a couple of videos which I'll share with you via Luan. Uh, after the fact um, about the adventures we had. Um, I'm not going to show you now because I'm not sure it'll work. But this was an amazing, amazing two days. We had a microsite built on the phone for anyone who checked out dumpfrank.com. We had some incredibly willing uh, actors who um, 
turned up for training on the morning, who ended up hula hooping, ice cream cart stealing, giving out flowers. On the bottom right-hand corner there, you can see them doing the Michael Jackson thriller dance. People absolutely loved them. Now, Adobe didn't like what we were doing. So they sent some Adobe um, executives out to move us on. Those executives uh, ended up getting selfies with us for their kids. So Adobe then sent the cops out. We sent, they sent police out to move us on. We showed them the license that we had to put 25 Frankenstein actors on a certain piece of pavement or sidewalk, as they call it, because, yes, those local authority licenses exist. And the cops um, got selfies with us for their kids and, 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 and left us alone. And absolutely everybody we met over two days, we just kept coming up with new ways to entertain, engaged with us. Now, we didn't know how we'd done. Obviously, we sent out a load of social media on the, on, on, on the morning, on the afternoon, the next day. And then we wrapped up and headed out of town. We had no idea how we'd done. Um, but the the results were absolutely fabulous. So... If you put aside just the ROI, which was uh, in both direct and indirect new business that we could attribute to the stunt about 30 to 1, which is about the biggest ROI ever, I've ever achieved with anything, the long tail of brand awareness and, and, and positive sentiment was also absolutely tangible. So our two YouTube videos, one created in 24 hours with a drone, another the making of, um, which again, I can send, it's two minutes long and put out two weeks later, um, garnered more than 75,000 views in the week of the activity in the month after. Clients and prospects told us that delegates inside the summit were only talking about one thing in their coffee breaks, and that was those crazy Frankensteins outside. And a client told us vendors try to make noise at the Adobe Summit every year, but this stunt got noticed like no other. So we ended up that year sending out uh, dump frank t-shirts and masks to clients and prospects on request. We hired senior sales execs from Adobe Following the stunt, they told us that after Dump Frank, Adobe had developed how to beat Cuba in a pitch training sessions for their sales team. Now, I tell this story not because it's the most fun I've ever had doing B2B marketing. Um, the idea was incredibly brave and um, acknowledged as a business risk while it was still only that. So, you know, it was just someone's idea. We had the management of a brilliant, incredible company felt it was worth doing in order to raise our profile among a supremely targeted audience. And the success of the stunt, we, we reckon, would hinge on the tone of the activity on the ground. So how happy and unthreatening the, the Frankensteins were. Can we entertain without annoying? Um, we managed it very carefully. We were ready to shut it down with a moment's notice if, and leave town if anything looked like it was going to go downhill. But as it happened, the bravery and the risk paid off. The social media went absolutely berserk. The activity turned out to be everything that our customers wanted to talk about that year. It galvanized our people across all markets, gave us the confidence as a company to explore uh, new and braver ways of telling all of our stories to the market in subsequent years. Quantifying the value of that, even above and beyond the, the £350,000 clients that we, 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 we won on the back of it, quantifying the value of that bravery that came through the activity it's not easy, but when you try something this big and this brave and it works, you never, ever look back. So I want to try a, a second one on you. This is um, a book that you may or may not have read. It's a fabulous book. It's a few years old, um, written by a guy called Sam Conniff Jr., um, it, called Be More Pirate. So it's a, it's a business book, so to speak, but it's also a book on life and culture about how all the stuff we don't know about pirates and the way they lived and the way they organized themselves and the way they dem democratized everything and the way they made everything fair and how we could learn from the pirates. But it's also about an attitude. It's also about, um, uh, you know, the, the campaign that he ran was very, very pink. Be more, pi be more crafty, be more rebellious, be more collaborative. And when he got it published by Penguin Random House, um, Penguin Random House, a very famous publisher in Britain, has this great big window of its office. It often uses the window to um, publicise all its best books with great big posters. And Sam went to the CEO of Penguin Random House and said, you know what, I, um, I'd love to use the windows to, 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 to campaign for the book. And the guy went, no, 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 you, you're not a big enough book. You're, you're a tiny book in a string of big books we've got this year. 
you, you don't qualify for the window. But but lovely book. Um, good luck with the campaign, but you're not using the windows. So instead of taking no for an answer, Sam wrote this letter uh, to all the, def the, the partners he needed, as if from Tom Weldon, CEO, basically fraud. Um, he said, dear Sam, uh, please take this as formal approval to proceed with the window installation at Penguin Random House. As discussed with Simon and Vinyl situations and Trevor, blah, blah, blah. License or approval from Westminster is uncalled for. So don't please don't go to the council because I'll get found out. Honestly, everything's fine. Please do try to keep the banner under wraps. I think the element of surprise is a key component to the success of the campaign. He's got a little typo there that I'm not sure uh, Tom Weldon, who he's impersonating, would, would, would appreciate. Thanks for arranging the cleaning of the window. Sorry that couldn't be sorted out earlier, blah, blah, blah. Let's see how that goes. So he basically impersonated the CEO of the publisher, sent it out, got it done. And what happened next lasted for only half a morning before it was taken down. But he stood for social uh, posts and photos. And as you can see, um, only the great Richard Branson was uh, caught onto it and said, you know, ask forgiveness, not permission. Great to see a unique ad approach to advertising. It reminds me of the fun we've had with our airlines. Congratulations on the book, Be More Pirate. This is the sort of stuff you have the power to get up to if you are able to um, break the rules a little bit and take what's coming to you, but you know you can create a little bit of impact. Indeed, you know, the rest of his campaign was things like this. That's Oprah Winfrey, obviously, and, you know, ranting over the brilliance of a book for her book club. But the book in her hand in real life is not Be More Pirate. He's just photoshopped that in there. He did the same with a load of different celebrities, with photos of them, with Be More Pirate stacked up on their bookshelves. Nobody ever got back to him and said, hey, do you know what? This is my reputation. Could you take that book out? Could you unphotoshop? They just thought it was funny. And because they thought it was funny, they wanted to get involved and publicize it. Last one, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to talk pretty quickly, but you should go and find a campaign online called the Zendesk Alternative. So this was brilliant. 2015, this was. I'm going back in time a bit because, you know, Zendesk Alternative is a social media campaign that's still talked about and remembered today. Its product marketing of that year wasn't, is not still talked about today. It's advertising. It's conference speeches of that year not remembered, wouldn't know anything about them. The Zendesk Alternative campaign was absolutely um, remembered and still talked about. So in 20, 2013, actually, uh, Zendesk is a cloud-based customer service platform providing ticketing self-service self options. And they had to form a struggling, fake struggling band called the Zendesk Alternative. What happened was the marketing team was monitoring search terms and noticed the trend. People were using the term Zendesk Alternative to go and find people uh, cheaper options than, than Zendesk. So decided to win some organic search traffic off the back of the term. The marketing team created this fake music group. They bought the name Zendesk Alternative, the domain online. They created a whole social media ecosystem and presence. So Twitter, MySpace, Think Bandcamp. They created beautifully acted parody videos of the band in rehearsals on YouTube, claiming, complaining between musical takes about the, about customer service software buyers landing on their website and seemed so authentic. It was almost hard to tell whether they were a spoof. The impact and brand awareness generated propelled Zendesk to become market leader. The fake site, Zendesk Alternative, converted at 95% higher than the main website. Zendesk attributed five huge closed deals uh, in the first six months to the campaign, but it, it was fun and it was brave. It's not the sort of thing business to business brands do. It grew the market, it drove awareness, it closed deals, it's still being talked about today. And, you know, I just think that we are in a position, you don't have to spend a great deal of money, but have a think about what the bravest thing you take the stuff that's in the content calendar, look at the stuff that you're putting out, especially if you feel forced to do so sometimes, and just think, could we do better? If the answer is yes, it's not on anybody else to do better. It's on us. I'm not going to show you the video. I'm going to go straight to my final case study. Loanne, have faith. Uh, three minutes to go. I think I'm going to get there for the first time in history. I don't know what to do with myself. I want to show you the difference between an established PR and content agency in London and New York and how they treat social versus one of my favorite brands, a boxed wine, uh, direct to consumer, um, genius little company called Lalo. Have a look at these two events. Uh, put together uh, on so and and broadcast on social by an, a, 
a PR and content agency that's been going since the 1960s and really should know better. Look at this. Podcasting offers untapped potential for brands. Good broadcast event this morning. Excellent. Was exactly what the PR agency wrote about its own event. Great to see another full house for our latest Good Broadcast Delivers event. Fascinating insight into the world of podcasts from BBC Newscast, blah, 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 blah. Basically, what they've done here is they've taken photos of the backs of people's heads. Rather than think about the content that's being spoken at the front by the brilliant panel they obviously got uh, involved and, and, and were proud to host from BBC whatever, I can't see what's on the slides. I can't see who's on the panel. So the content is defunct. The content they're putting out is, look, full house. Now, the most interesting thing about any event is not that people turn up. That is a given. If you don't have people turning up, you don't have an event. The most interesting thing about any event is not that people have backs of heads. Again, a given for most of us, you know, you'd hope. So why are you taking photos of the backs of people's heads and ignoring what I'd love to know, which is you guys, your social media marketers, you know how to write a headline. This is not a headline. People came to our event is not a headline. The headline is person X, amazing, said this, <clears throat> unbelievable, about this. Really? That's the headline. Similarly, uh, same, same agency. This week, our corporate and property team was joined by Jonathan Prynne, associate editor at the Evening Standard, who talked to us about his career highlights, where he sees the news agenda heading and the importance of projecting confidence and building trust through communication to today's society. Our recent Living Brand NX report also reveals new, here's that word again, insights for brands looking to build trust in a challenging economic climate. Thank you to Jonathan and everyone who came along to the event. It was a night of hugely valuable third time insights. So, right, let me just get it straight. You got the associate editor of the Evening Standards come and talk to you, and all you have written is that he spoke about some stuff and there were insights. It's such a waste of an opportunity. I'm not going to go on, but you can see it. Again, here's some more backs of heads. We had a full house today. Event with Matthew Shaw at BBC News. Lots of great insights. What were the insights? Tell me what the fucking insights were. Great to have some new and familiar faces. So there were new and familiar faces there. Well, that's a headline and a half. Thanks to everyone for coming along. Keep your eyes peeled for details on the next one, but only come if you've got the back of a head because that's what we're going to focus on. Tell me what happened. Tell me what was said. This is the CEO of the agency on April the 4th. Fact, celebrity crews is in Webby's People's Voice. Fact, they can't win without your vote. Fair enough. I went to see what else he'd written on social. He's not on Instagram, so he's only on Twitter uh, and LinkedIn. The last time he, he was on social media, guys, was April 23, 2020. So three years ago, exactly, to the month. Three years since he's been on social media. That's the, that's the, eight, the, the head of a content agency. And that was, check out my latest article, me, 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 building brands through a pandemic. This is Lalo. This is a, a, a company that I absolutely love. Their wines are fabulous, but, but more. They had a mission. They were two really smart women from the wine industry who decided, hang on, how come France treats boxed wine like it treats bottled wine and loads and loads of market? And we treat boxed wine like it's just come out of Aldi and it's for a work do only and it's always going to be warm and on the end of a really badly laid table. Boxed wine can be cool. It's also super sustainable. You get more for your money. And we're going to go around the world picking excellent independent wines from independent winemakers. We're going to design boxes of beauty, and we're going to see if we can get people to drink boxed wine in this UK. Their website is beautiful, but you'd expect their website to be beautiful. Take a look at their social. This is what their social looks like. Think about this compared to the backs of people's heads, okay? What do you think of flamenco? You probably imagine the fiery romance of its most famous dance, the tango, but to achieve the illusion of impulsive passion requires years of study. Why are they talking about tango? Why are they talking about Spain? Because their latest wine, Design Lot 10, at Malbec, is inspired by a traditional flamenco fan or pericon. So this is their social media. These are the beautiful pictures they put up. They hire uh, flamenco dancers to hit Covent Garden and give out samples. They get social media going through the roof. When they've got a campaign to do, they go hellish for leather. So two, two little uh, examples here. One is um, they're trying to get their rosé into a, a restaurant. So they have people from their team just holding signs up. That, uh, that picture was headlined something like, um, it's been ages since I flirted, can you tell? The one on the right-hand side was April Fool's Day. They put out these two lunchtime uh wine drinks um lunchtime size lunchbox size 
Um, it was an April Fool's. People loved it, though, and now they're looking into what it would take to add that to the Lalo range. They're really, really cool. They get loads of engagement. They sent people to Glastonbury with um, boxes. They, 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 they got absolutely hundreds of thousands of people applying when they asked for five Glastonbury influencers. They said, listen, guys, bottles of wine aren't allowed at Glastonbury. Our boxes are perfect. You can keep them cool like this. Here's an ice pack. Here's a bag. Who wants to go and give out our, um, our, our, our wine boxes in Glastonbury? Hundreds of thousands of people applied. Um, they found some wine influencers. They sent everybody. They got loads of great pictures. Um, it was absolutely perfect. They were a part of Glastonbury this year. Um, what else have they done? They, 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 they write, they target restaurants and cafes uh, by brand and say, listen, we love your menu, Pizza Express. We've got a crush on you, but we can't get you to pick up the phone. So do you know what? Instead of trying to pick up the phone where we're going to pitch our Pinot Grigio to put on your menu, we're going to make you a mixtape. And they sent beautiful boxes of wine with a proper mixtape, old school, um, with a playlist that they put on Spotify and got it downloaded hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Really, really smart stuff. And what happened? They have recently been uh, Laura Riches, who's one of the two Laura's involved with founding Lalo. They're now doing um, millions and millions of boxes per year. I want to tell you a stat in a minute that's going to blow your minds. Um, they went on the hundred most influential uh, wine or, or drinks people in drinks industry people list, along with Kylie. There's Laura there. Still can't get it out of our head that our very own LRI. Uh, Laura Richards is featured alongside Kylie in the 100 Most Influential People in Drinks. Why am I telling you all this stuff? Because they used to spend £30,000 on paid advertising at Facebook per month. They used to spend 30 grand a month on paid advertising. But these guys have got so good at social and organic and brand events and PR that they've cut all paid spend. They don't spend a penny on marketing now, apart from their social. They're focusing everything on social. What's been the, event, uh, the effect? They've doubled their revenue this year. Go and tell your bosses about a company that has doubled its revenue by taking, I'm not saying paid advertising is bad. I wouldn't advise any of my clients to drop multi-channel marketing, but these guys are proving that if you get good at social, it has commercial impact.